That's amazing. I have chills. And what's so cool is you're going to follow that thread. So follow that thread and then you'll see what else is next. You'll see what else you really miss or you really love and you, and we get to have it. instance um my eating disorder you know um oh this is so great i'm on my food plan like this is the best thing ever thank god i'm in recovery like it's all good and then you know time passes time passes stress builds uh and then i might relapse or might you know if i was still using it would just be oh that's the time for the event you know the 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 using my um addiction of choice and so so to so we don't get to beat ourselves up for repeating a cycle because that is what human beings are that's what the psyche is but what we can do is again choose make a choice to do advanced personal growth work and do it differently when i first heard the you know when i was first listening to the question it it kind of you know what came up for me is like uh emotional cutting so emotional cutting, so emotional self-injury. Um, and, and even that, like, it's, it's not even like, so if I were to go look at people that have hurt me in the past, um, you know, so just the act of doing that, I'm now, you know, I'm now being unconscious. I'm now um, doing an old behavior. I'm just doing the pattern and that in and of itself hurts. And then once you see, if you're anything like <laughs> me, but it's like, it's just so astonishing the crazy ass thoughts that I can think about someone else um, and the great, their great life, you know, how amazing it is and how great they look and, oh, look at their kids are happy, <laughs> you know, it, it, and, and it's, it's just going to be downhill. And so all those thoughts, all that comparing, all that feeling less than is all is, so, is another level of my emotional self-harm. Um, so this, for me, this requires two things. One is an existential choice, meaning I'm not going, I, I swear to God, like I am not going to do that again. I don't want to feel that. And I'm going to, you know, make that intention, make that commitment to myself today. I'm just not, I'm going to leave that life behind. Okay, great. Well, PS, it's on its way back because again, we live in patterns. We do patterns. And so we repeat cycles. And so I've made that choice. So now I got to use my tools. So now it's time for me to, if I actually really want that for myself, then I need to, now what tools do I need? Well, for one, I have to get off social media for a while, or if you, you know, if you need it for your job or whatever, like you make sure you like for, there was a long time when I, um, when I first got on social media, just like everyone else, you know, just like curious about the follows and who's following, you know, how many, and it's like, Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. And then I'm like, God, I can't look at that follower account anymore. <laughs> like it was, again, it was just like, you know, 10, 50 people or something. And it's like, I could tell you, I did a piece of work about letting that not be any influence me in any way. And, and so, and sometimes because I'm a human that, that same kind of whatever comparing or less than, or I need more. Um, it's like I can do that thing where it's like, no, oh, there it is again. I must be unconscious. I must be anyway. So for so if that follower thing was still bothering me, I would say, okay, what do I need to do? Okay, I can't get on social media like I want to. Or and there were times where I would literally put the thumb my thumb over the number because I really wanted to practice to not be influenced by yays or nays, and you know, so I could continue to do for me, work that's authentic and not ego-based. So, um, 
so there there's one like literally hold my thumb over the thing so whatever it is that you if it's for your job and you have to do it you you get on there and you you make a commitment that you're going to do your work and then you're going to get right back off um you can support people in your circle if you want to do that but i would make make it a time limit and then um then i have to start noticing like because at some point you just like a diet or any new exercise program we start like there's energy and motivation and excitement and enthusiasm in the beginning and so even we uh, we all i'm sure you all have done that as well like i'm like i'm gonna be free from this forever now <laughs> and it's like oh i just fell into a hole um so so we have to again continue to do to use our tools to figure out strategies. And so, you know, if I say I'm never going to eat that thing again, and then all of a sudden it's in my cart, um, food addiction, in case anybody didn't know, um, I, that's like, oh, of course this is happening. What is happening here? I am regressing. So I need to put that back or as far as, you know, looking up the people, I'm not going to do that to myself today. And then again, when we, when we take something out of our life that has served us in some way, and this is serving you because people don't do what doesn't serve them. Uh, that means you, we don't, when we take something away that we used to do a maladaptive behavior or whatever, we actually have to replace it with something great for ourselves. We don't, you know, and whatever the support I needed, I have to put that in there instead of looking or have to, um, you know, just, it, you know, of course, I'm a, a freeze mode person. So, you know, something to me, it's like, well, if I'm giving that up this week, I, I need to put less on my calendar. Like, I just need to give myself some, some more time. But do not beat yourself up. And we, we don't get to beat ourselves up for um, falling into the patterns. They're, it, it's amazing. It, it's, it's phenomenal. It's not the masses to break a cycle for even one day and then that one day cycle broken leads to another one now that's two days and three days and then you just build on and then you, you'll get to the place in your life where it's like oh my gosh i used to do that i haven't done that in like a year so i hope that that was helpful thanks for that we had one comment on when you were talking mm -hmm. and um the person is L and she was saying that one thing that she's noticed when you're answering a lot of these questions, specifically this one too, is that there's a running theme that she's noticing. It's be nice to yourself, even mm -hmm. though she's heard that and still tend to forget it and go around in a cycle anyway. And that's what she's finding out mostly is helping with these chats is just awesome. Nice to yourself and yes. You yes, so, absolutely. That was excellent insight. L. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next we have up is Heather and she has a question she'd like to ask you. All right. Are you still on? There she hey is. Guys. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I noticed while I was reading um, Pete Walker's book and he was mentioning role playing assertiveness that my brain was automatically uh, replacing assertive with aggressive. And it kept mm. tripping me up over and over. I, I reread that paragraph over and over again. I had to stop and like, what is tripping me up? Because I see it, mm -hmm. but it's not interpreting that way. So I stopped. I was like, okay, well, what about assertive? And then I realized, well, they're synonyms to each other, but their context is different. Mm -hmm. So is that like a fond thing that I learned growing up in order to make myself small so because that was just tripping me up yes will you remind me what he means by that assertive what uh role playing so role playing. Uh, so what is he talking yeah. about uh, as a survivor learns to stay present in assertive role plays she becomes aware of how fear triggers her fawning she can then practice staying present to her fear and acting assertively anyway and my brain just kept interchanging assertive with aggressive and assertively with aggressively. Yes, 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 yes. So just to be clear, he's talking about when we're recovering, when we're recovering yeah. and, and he's trying to give us a skill to learn how to um, 
start acting like a person as opposed to a servant. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> I have a story um, about, about this, but so, so the way that I talk about what Pete, Pete Walker is suggesting is when you have heard me talk about scripts, like we need a script for that. We need, um, we need a you know a plan for whatever the comeback might be. We we need to have something kind of like right there in us, ready to go for when that person you know does their annoying thing. Um, so I, here's my thoughts about. So the, your the question that you asked, I would say absolutely one hundred percent, because if something for fawns. Again, fawn is extreme people pleasing in order to survive. If somebody is a fawn, that means we they were entrained in childhood to never be aggressive. That wasn't gonna be okay. You just needed to follow my directions. And guys, I gotta tell you, and you may start getting sick of me saying it, but the more that I think about this shit, like about childhood trauma, it, it, the, it just keeps reminding me of like a cult, like being raised in a cult. And in it, you know, it's just like the, the brainwashing and the, um, what's the thing the kidnappers have the uh, Stockholm syndrome and all that. And so if we are now, you know, a, a, a really, Uh, just bear with us. Is Elizabeth frozen on your guys' end too? The trauma is yeah. saying to us. Elizabeth, can you repeat what you said for like the last 15 seconds? Yes. Um, so Pete Walker is saying, hey, you know, hey, P.S., you have childhood trauma and here's some skills. When we even contemplate the skill or we would even consider the skill, um, we will be repelled by it. We will be disgusted by it. We will, we will, uh, you know, that's not in line with my values and we will mean it. And, and so one of the things that I have done for myself is I, and we've all, we're all good at it. We're all good at it because <laughs> we've been doing it our whole lives, which is, um, kind of being a, uh, a chameleon and kind of, you know, trip to fit in and we know what the right things are to say and all of that stuff. And so, so I lost my train of thought, hold on. I'm sure it'll come back. Um, well, it's because what I noticed is in the previous page, he was mentioning it, but not in the context of role playing. And I was fine with it. I read it as assertive, but then when he switched over yes. my brain, namaste and was like aggressive. Yes. Yeah, goodbye. I don't want this anymore. And and what's good about that too, that's a way to keep somebody in the cult is like if you if you touch on like if you read something, it's like, hey, you might be in a cult. You might want to think about this differently. Um, we could like, oh, I think because it resonates, like that's me. Like I have childhood trauma. I must have those because everything you're saying in this book is me. And then when we get to the things of like, let's start healing that, let's do it differently. Um, we will hate it. Like we won't be interested in it and we, it will repel us because we're not allowed. It's breaking a code. It, you know, we, again, we, we're fawns because we had to figure out how to survive. Like this is life and death for us. And so, um, so what I do is I translate. That was the thing I forgot. I translate. So I have to translate things for myself. I have to translate things that I tell other people but so in this case, and this is my inner, inner voice, inner dialogue, it would be like, OP Walker, thank you so much for giving me the, the word uh, fawn. I, I love it. Thank you. But I cannot do this assertive or aggressive. Like I can't, I can't think of it like that. So let me make my new word. I will make a word. And I am known for making up words. And, <laughs> uh, and so for me, so I'm wondering if you were to make up a word for this assertive role playing, what, what word would you choose? 
to be honest, I was thinking about that and I just, I couldn't, it was such a block that I was like, nope, 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 danger, 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 danger. Excellent. I want to ask you now, um, do, do you, what, what do you think about the word role playing? So no adjective, just the role playing. How do you feel about that as a strategy to heal? Well, I mean, I do it with myself. I, when I prepare for meetings or any kind of sensitive talks, I will do it with myself sometimes in front of a mirror, sometimes walk it around, just, you know, the things that c could possibly come up. And then I respond to that. So okay, perfect. that's so, what I do with myself. But the thought of doing it with somebody else, is just like, um, yeah. yeah. And that's why we have to do baby steps, like be baby, baby, baby steps. Um, so you have a way in, that means you already have the skills. You already have the, the synapses because you've been doing it on yourself. And so I suggest start, you know, I have to go really slow because the thing is I need to make sure that I'm safe. And even though it's a healthy behavior, if the healthy behavior doesn't feel safe to me, then it's not going to work for me because something will happen and I won't be able to, you know, to execute the thing that I really want to do, execute the boundary or execute the whatever. So how, do, so, you know, you've heard me talk about scripts, before oh we we have scripts for that like if somebody's being you know saying elizabeth you're a dummy and then i could say um you may be right but i actually still like pictures of goody tama or whatever you know what i mean so so it's like you may be right is that role playing you may be right instead of like how dare you condescend to me you know it's just like oh okay um, in other words i'm not going to take the bait so how how have has that landed with you like when i say oh there's there's a script for that or we can use a script for that how does that sound scripts are fun okay perfect you okay always love scripts yes okay so then i for me i would change anytime i see him say uh, a sort of role playing i just say i'll use my script you know or i'll, I'll use my advanced bitch script and then that feels um it seems like that resonates with you more. Is that, yeah. Yeah, because so, it's just like assertive role playing, it's sort of, and it just switched to aggressive. I'm like, huh, huh, they're the same, but not the same. Why am I automatically going there? We will repel it. It is against, it, 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 it's like it's against our nature. It, it's, it's a betrayal. It's a betrayal to the family of origin. It's, a, it's, um, you know, a lot of us knew like in our guts, like we knew that if we were rebellious or if we were bad or if we were, you know, did something wrong or we broke a rule, uh, that it was actually not even a fantasy, but a real life, um, real life that our parent, our parents would just say goodbye. There's the door, you know? And so that's why it is life and death for us, life and death for us. So, um, so we need to, uh, to practice. We need to, it just needs to practice. So I just, I wouldn't even use those words anymore. So you, you, you feel good about an advanced pitch script. And so that'll, that'll help you. I hope that was helpful. No, okay, that was cool. helpful. I just have to find a different word for it. Yes. So you can use advanced pitch, um, script or just script or Heather script, you know, you can just, yeah, or healthy or boundary script, anything like that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I love that. A Heather script. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next we have up is Becca. Um, and she has a question that how would you go about finding a new therapist because her original therapist was killed. And right now she's working through the feelings of a mental block, the thinking she's, that um, she's going to replace her uh, if she finds a new therapist. Oh my goodness, so Rebecca, I'm so or, sorry. Or, or, or Becca. <gasps> hey, Becca, Hi. That, is, that is traumatic. I'm so sorry. Yeah, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long ago was this? Um, a year ago. A year ago. 
And um, how'd you find out? Um, well, I just graduated from TCU, and so I was meeting with her, like, weekly, sometimes more than weekly, for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and they sent a mass email to the entire school at 11.45 at night, like, three days later, telling everyone what happened, and it was over spring break, and so I was, I'm from Houston, and so I was at the rodeo, and Obviously, I had like a meltdown while I was there and yes. people were asking if I needed medical attention and thought that I needed to go to the hospital. And yeah, I just ha I know that I need to go back, but I haven't been able to make myself go back in fear of replacing her. Yes. Okay. Oh my gosh. What a great question. Thank you. I'm so honored. Um, that is a trauma. Just, I mean, you already know it from just your, your having experienced it. Um, and that would, your reaction would also be my reaction. Like, it, it's like, it, <laughs> I will need medical attention if anything happens to my therapist. I mean, it's just, it's just a given. Um, so uh, this may seem lame, but, um, but I, I don't mean it to be. And I don't, it, 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 it's just the example that that for me is most like this. Okay, so I had, um, again, I'm not comparing in any way, shape or form and you'll, you'll hear it in the end, but I had this amazing dog, like this amazing, like I might tear up right now. She was an Irish setter. She was funny as fuck. She was, and, and and then she was 14 years old and she died like of natural causes or whatever, like just of old, old, old age. And, um, and I took it harder than I even could have imagined taking it. Like it brought me to my knees. And that's when I figured out that, uh, there's something actually very important when you have an animal in your house and you're working through trauma. So Jewel was my ride or die as I was working on my trauma. And I, uh, it was, it was difficult anyway. So she died and I'm like, well, I'm not doing that again. Like, <laughs> like I can't, can't. It, it wasn't really like I'm not doing it again, but it was just like, I don't know if I can, I literally don't know if I can do it again. And it took me three years. And one of the things that, and I didn't, you know, how grief pops up in all these strange ways. And I had grieved her. So, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I was still grieving every day, three years later or anything, but, uh, so I did my grief work on all that stuff. And then it came three years later, I bought another dog, Amelie. And, um, as I was getting ready to get her, I remember talking to my therapist and, and just falling. Like, I, I feel that, like this is a betrayal <laughs> to my jewel. Like, you know, no, it, it, you can't replace that. And then I, and, and it was also like, again, sorry, I'm so weird. Um, I'm like, I'm not going to love this dog. It's not like, it just like, I, and that makes me feel bad for this dog. Should I get it up? Blah, blah, blah. So all that. And, um, and she helped me. She said the most amazing, amazing thing to me. She just said, Jewel will always be the dog of dogs. Jewel will always be the dog of dogs. You are supposed to, and you've been guided to this place to get another dog, but she will not be the dog of dogs. She will be an amazing dog. She will love you like a dog, you know, like she, she, you guys will have a great relationship. And she was correct, but that this amazing person that you know got you through your rough times and was so supportive to you and and took care of you you know she may be your therapist of therapists she may be that and you know and and i feel that way about my therapist i i thank god i'm to the place of where it's like i know i'll be okay no matter what i totally know that but i don't you know that again the idea of it and I, and I know I could tell you that I would not want to get another therapist. I wouldn't want to because they wouldn't be that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, well, 
I'll be a fucking train wreck if I'm not in therapy. <laughs> so I'm going to figure out how I will, when that day comes and it will, I will go and find somebody. They will never be like my therapist. No one will ever touch that. And so how, how does that, how is that sitting with you? I agree with what you're saying. I think it's just hard for me because I already have a lot of like emotional trauma that's happened in my life. Yeah. And so I, my family was upset with me because I was more sad that my therapist was killed versus when my great grandparents died. And I, they're like two totally different things because like my therapist was hit by a drunk driver versus like my great grandparents were old. And so I think it's just trying to find a balance of like what I need as Becca versus like what other people need because Mm -hmm. I'm the type of person that always feels like I have to please everybody else before myself. Of course. course. And so I know that I need to go back to therapy because I'm a disaster but it's still just so hard for me to move past that mental block of. Yeah. I, um, like, I don't know. I still feel like I would be replacing her, even though I know that I'm not. And I know that she would want me to go back to therapy. So I don't know. It's like trying to find a balance. (laughs) Yeah. You, you will, you, you will find that balance. Um, And I really like that you said, um, so I'm a grief expert and one of the the things that's kind of new in grief research is meaning making. So how am I going to, you don't do this at first, but you know, in the end, like, how am I going to make meaning from this loss? How's this loss going to impact my life? And I hear, you know, that since you know, she would want you to get the support that you needed, um, that would be a way of honoring her actually. Um, I, it, it wants my pet peeve for people to judge other people's grief. Your grief was right. But I got to tell you, like the relationship that we can have with the therapist, it's a very sacred thing. And, you know, she, she was the first person to like truly understand like truly, truly, truly understand and accept me as is. And that is, That is very impactful for those of us who have had that past. Um, Yeah. So, so you, you will, you just keep moving forward. And I, when I get a new therapist, whenever that happens, I will say, hello. um, I had this great relationship with this other therapist And my first probably month of sessions are going to be talking about how I don't want to be in your office. (laughs) And I mean, I will, I will do that. And, and, and that person better be fucking good. Sorry. Like better be fucking good to, to be able to handle that. Cause that's what I'm going to be talking about for a long time Mm -hmm. is how, how hard this is. And, and so, so you get to do that. You get to do that. Like find the therapist says, my past therapist died. Can you please help me um, come to terms with that? So at least you know what you're going to talk about for the first few sessions. True. Thank you. You're so, so welcome. Thank you, Becca. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Next, uh, Elizabeth, we have Amy. Uh, And her question is surrounding that uh, she was in a bad relationship with her husband. She worked on herself, setting her boundaries, uh, became a very strong, independent woman, felt very healthy. Um, But then things happened. He took the kids away from her. She had a DUI, things of that nature. And she ended up going back to him to make the pain stop, even though it's a temporary solution. Yeah. Um, So her question is really uh, how she's so sad because the woman that left him was strong, confident, healthy, like I said, but she seems to have disappeared now and she wants to know Mm -hmm. how to get back there. How does Mm -hmm. she feel confident again um, instead of feeling weak and like she sold herself out? Yeah. Amy, did did what I said earlier about 
the pattern the, the the going back in the cycle did that make sense to you yeah hold me let's unmute her okay can you can i um will you say hello hi okay hey sweetheart um so did that make sense to you that that's just kind of what we do unless a new thing happens we'll just repeat the cycle it also just just never thought of it before but it's just the inertia of the cycle like when we are trying to break a cycle, we actually have to get out of the cycle, but inertia is trying to push us forward. Um, right. What happened to you was traumatic. Him with the kids and then the accident or the, the DUI or whatever, or the, the, that's, those are traumas. Like those are yeah. actual. And those are just like one of the things, like we yes. were in therapy for two years before that and our counselor like tried to talk to him about being cluster b personality disordered and of course that like went over his head so mm. like there was like violations he had people following me um like he doesn't understand boundaries and so it was just like um during that time on top of everything else he kept my kids from me wouldn't let them talk to me wouldn't let them right. see me they were little right. like four five and six and mm -hmm. um yeah, so like my choice was to just lose my kids to him forever or go back. Yeah. And now I'm like looking back and I'm like, dang, like now I have social anxiety that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. I have like all these things happening mm -hmm. and it's like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I, um, we're moving on from trauma. You're being abused straight up. Like that's what personalities disorders do. Um, are you in therapy? I was for a really long time and I haven't been recently since I've been back here. I don't know. I tried to, we, we moved to a different place. So I'm in a completely mm -hmm. different place mm -hmm. and I don't know anybody here. So of course I'm isolated on top of that. And, yeah. um, which is the part of their design. Yeah, it is. Um, and of course he doesn't want me to get a job because what if somebody talks to me, um, because during that time that we were split up, um, I had met somebody and I was seeing somebody else and he knew about it. So now, you know, in his mind, I had already filed for divorce and, um, tried to move on. Um, but in his mind, I was just having a, an affair on him because he has no ability to actually see what was happening. Correct. So now, you know, everything, not only is he got all this other issues, now the other ammunition he has at me is that, you know, I was having an affair during that time and um, forget that he was sleeping with married women during that time. Oh, of course, of course. That's like irrelevant. Like his friend's wife. He doesn't, yeah, it's yeah. irrelevant. He doesn't want to talk about it because it's not the same thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, so now that we're in Corona land, um, would your other therapists work with you through like uh, telemedicine or um, uh, do it online or on the phone? Um, I'm sure that's how I was seeing her before. So I just need to reach out. I guess yeah. I, like I said, I just, I've had so much, like, I, honestly, like she supported me through when I left and just mm -hmm. going back to tell her that I'm back in this situation again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's fair. That's fair. Um, if she's good and you know, whether she's good or not, that will be, um, I mean, it, it, yeah, if she's good, there won't be any, any, it'll just be nothing but acceptance, full blown, like loving, loving acceptance and full blown compassion and understanding if she's good. Um, but you know, already in your gut, whether she's the person and it may, she may not be the person. So, right. so but, but I, you know, again, I, I find myself evolving over the years to like, like, I recommend weekly counseling, like, like at the bare minimum, like the bare minimum to give you, you know, to give you support, to give you, um, to give you tools to use. Um, it, I know it's annoying, but I, you know, I, I'm just, if we're in a relationship with somebody that's verbally abusive, manipulative, et cetera, et cetera, all the narcissistic things, um, we, we have, there's no choice. Like we have to be in therapy. Um, it, it just to survive it. I will also tell you that I have found it to be a very common thing, 
um, again, just my, not, and not in research, but just my experience of being a therapist, that um, a lot of people will, a lot of, I only work with women, so a lot of women will stay um, because they know they'll lose their kids. Because the narcissist, they will, they, again, they will scorch the earth before they let you have any. Yeah, exactly. He made my yeah. life hell. Like he yeah, literally he made my life hell. Yeah, absolutely. And so I know that they will, um, and, and I, I have just seen it so much. So it's either a person who comes to me later, like later in life, the kids are already grown or the person still in it. And we, and, and like, this is very common. Okay. And, and so, so what's going to be, re okay. So I have a theory about the new things like social anxiety or whatever, like the new things that are on, on board is because you've got a level of freedom. You had a level of freedom, like you had reached, you know, a higher place in your personal growth and then you went back, but you still have the higher place feeling feelings inside of you. And so, you know, sometimes when we're, when we're in a relationship with a toxic person, like let's say, even say a family member, and then I do all this personal growth. If I get back around that person, it might hurt me more because now I'm more vulnerable. And I found what it was like, like I had a moment when I loved myself and, and now I don't have that anymore. And so that makes my life harder. So it doesn't surprise me. Um, well, yeah, as I got healthy, he got even worse and worse yep. and worse and worse because yep. there were certain things that I just wasn't willing to stand for. And I, in my, my no, I like, I know that I can't stay in this forever because yeah. it's not like, it's not good for my mental or emotional health. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know how to deal with somebody who's constantly violating me, who goes yeah. through my things, who, you know, yeah. all of that stuff. Like, I don't know how I can be healthy and deal with that at the same time, but I know right now, like, I need to get myself back into a place where I'm at least healthy enough mentally and emotionally to, you know, make more wise decisions. Yeah. Like, I trusted him last time. Um, I didn't just, I should have went and got the restraining order immediately when I left him, and I didn't do that, and I trusted him, and he ended up doing that to me, mm. and keeping the kids okay. from me using the courts. Very common. And then I was... And I was powerless because he was using the courts and he is this loved guy in the community that we were in. Like I had a video of him pushing me off of my own front porch and I called the police and the police officer said, it looks to me like he was defending his property. You need mm -hmm. to get off of it. Yeah. I'm like, this, this, this is, is all my very house. common. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, it's, so it's I, tragic and, and horrific and abusive and a nightmare, and they are really, really good at it. And that is why it might be twice a week therapy for a while, like to get your little self back and to give you the tools to do what you want to do and what you need to do. Okay. It's very hard, but you need a lot, a lot, a lot of support, like yeah. so much, not yeah. because of you, but because you are in a, a psychological war zone. Yeah, absolutely. And like when I left and he planned, like he secretly tricked me into taking the kids because I had the kids and he had his mom lie to me and say she was taking them to the movies. And he, because we were separated at that time, he came and took the kids and went and filed court papers and wouldn't let me have them. My own mother, she, like I can see now why I got into this situation because my yeah. own mother is a lot like him. Yeah. Like he, he stopped by her house and let her hug my kids and like she was cheering him on of so it's like I don't have family support necessarily no. either so it's like yes promise me you will start looking into therapy for you to figure out your life and how to survive this yeah I will thank yeah. you you're so you're so so welcome you're doing amazing and I gotta tell you everything that you said like I swear to God, nothing will ever surprise me what a narcissist does. Nothing. He is freaking crazy. People yeah. don't believe me. And I'm like, you have no I idea. If you. He, if you meet him, he seems like a nice, like quiet spoken guy. And he's not like mm -hmm. he will. And he admits it. He will psychologically fuck you up. Amy, I want to, I want you to see something. Who believes her? Raise your hand. If you believe her, I want you to see this. Are you seeing it? You believe her. We believe you. We know. We absolutely know. Thank you, everybody.
Thank um, you. You are so, so you, you, yes. Um, you're amazing. Thank you for being so vulnerable for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Amy, when you get a chance, um, look in the chat because there's lots of messages of love for you. Um, okay, then, thank you, ladies. Um, and then afterwards, I'll make sure to send out the chat sanitized so you guys can see it, so you guys can okay. read through it if you're missing it right now. All right, okay, thank we're you. gonna move. We're gonna move on to Sharon. Um, she uh, is, has a question but she doesn't have sound right now. So I'm going to kind of relay information back and forth between you guys. But her question is, how do I get beyond external validation? Um, what's that joke? Like, how do I, how, how, do, how, do, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. It, 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 that, that, and that is, oh, that's a, such a, or, or issue for any of those, any of us who have um, childhood trauma. Like it, it, it just goes with the territory because if you, if you, um, it makes sense because again, if we're people pleasers in order to survive along with our other ways that we survived, that we all have to be taking the temperature of everyone else in the room and even before that, before pleasing the adults, we're also um, t seeing if we're okay. I want to know if I'm okay, so I need to look at her to see her if she thinks that I'm okay. There is no internal, um, intrinsic love or feeling of even okayness or um, what was the word? How do I get beyond what was the word that she used? Uh, and she validation, used, uh, right? Uh, yeah, validation. Validation. Um, <laughs> I'm just picturing like we're all little fawns and we have our parking ticket and we're gonna just see who can validate it for us to make sure we're okay, or we, you know, make sure that I'm validated. And um, that is that is uh, textbook, 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 text, textbook. And I guarantee you that all of us on this call, on the, on this um, video chat, we have even e either been there <laughs> or we are still there. It's just what those are the only two choices. We either were there or we're still there. And, and it really um, takes practice. And I think this is the same thing of the cult. Like we look to the cult, you know, cult members look to a cult to, they judge whether I am okay or not. And for me to even think, to have the audacity to not do that, to not, not only check with them, but to not even do it at all, just to get it from in here. No, it, it feels like death to us. It just feels like death. And, and so that's how hard it is. This is the, the, all of this shit is just a constant unlearning of childhood trauma. It's, you know, and again, I've said on here before, I don't, I don't think that you've been on one of these um, Zoom meetings before, but I say it a lot that we, um, it, it, like we, we don't know another way. We don't have anything in here. We weren't taught any of the words. We weren't taught any of the, um, you know, self-love, self-love, self-knowledge, self, -love, self interest, self, self, for any of us, the only self that we were allowed to have was selfish. And it was, is a word used as a weapon against us, even though we were completely the opposite of that. So it, 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 but I think we go back to what do we need to change? We need an existential choice and then we need the tools. And so um, I'm sad I can't hear your voice by the way, but it's okay. <laughs> I'll be okay. I'm gonna hear it again. 
uh, at another call, hopefully. But um, I'm just very, I'm an introvert. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I'm an introvert myself. I yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, can, I can relate. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Well, I got to hear your voice. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Although remember, I don't need to hear anybody else's voice. If you want to um, not speak, that you are just as welcome as anybody who is speaking. So it's all, it's all the same. So thank you. Um, but it's the existential choice and a set of skills. And so um, sometimes it takes a while just to be able to make the existential choice because it does feel like death. It feels like jumping off a cliff because we don't have any frame of reference for it. We don't. And so it, it you know, and this is kind of how I've done my personal growth work. It's just like, oh, fuck, now I got to get in. Now I got to validate myself from the inside. Like, oh, how do I do that? I don't know. I'm not going to, you know, I don't feel it today. You know, I'm, I don't want to validate my own ticket. Like, I'm not going to, I'm looking down on the fact that I'm laying around or being lazy or, you know, like it, it, it that's what it looks like in the beginning. It's like a big old mess. And that, um, and, and so I'll give you one of the, um, pieces of wisdom from the 12 step rooms is if I can't, you know, ask myself, can I self validate today? No, still looking at it from out here. Okay. That's fine. Can I make the existential choice? You know what? I'm not even ready for that. Can I be willing to make the existential choice? We can do that. That to me is a, that word willing that we are, that's our choice is we begin to become willing to not validate externally. Like we come willing to do that. It's like, how do we do it? We'll figure that out as we go. But, um, and everyone here has that willingness or you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't resonate with you. You wouldn't like any of my stuff. It, I just make you mad all the time. Um, you're all willing. And so now the next step is, and, and I got to tell you, that is freedom. Like that, that word willing is like, huh. And then it takes the pressure off of me. And then I just learn how to do it. I learned to practice, practice, practice. Was that helpful? Yeah, it was. Thank okay, you. Good. You're very, very welcome. Okay, perfect. Uh, next we have Amy, or I'm sorry, Abby. Hey, Abby. Um, Abby says that she has a handful of friends who have been interested in learning some of the stuff that she learned when she was in treatment. Uh, what suggestions or things or things I need to watch out for? Would you have uh, to try to lead that group when I'm just as fucked up or more than all of them? So basically helping teach them what she's um, learning. I'm the perfect person to ask this question because I'm completely fucked up. I think like I'm the, <clears throat> have my PhD in it. I have, um, I'm fucked up royalty. So you were asking exactly the correct person. So um, I'll tell you what comes up for me is um, also there's that saying, like we teach what we need to learn. Uh -huh. And, and I have to tell you, it's one of the, mo the most awesome benefits of actually becoming a therapist who, who has integrity and a therapist who walks her fucking walk is a lot of this stuff like self love and self care, a lot of that has come from the fact that while well, I'm a fucking therapist, I better love myself. Not only, I mean, I didn't really think about this at the time, but I, my clients would be never a good fit because I wouldn't love myself. And, you know, it just would have been a mess. So actually the work itself would have been a mess, but, um, so, so it's, it, it was, it was like a tricky way. Like I was saying, it's like the set of skills, like become a therapist, become a therapist was a good skill to have. It may be that the whole time it was just for me to trick myself into loving myself, to trick myself into self care, to trick, because I'm not going to sit in a fucking chair and lie to a bitch. Like, I'm not going to say, you know, you journal, you walk, you do this, you do that. You set that, you set that boundary. I'm not going to set a good boundary, but you said, I'm not doing that. That's not me. That's not, that's never been me. Um, and so, uh, so I, and so how, how is that sitting? I have a couple other things to say about it, but how does that make sense? 
Yes, totally. Yeah. And um, so I'll, I'll teach, how long have you been out of uh, treatment? Um, just basically a year. That's actually great. That's, that's the, then this is probably a good time. Of course, obviously trust your judgment, but, um, and, and so I used to I work think for, mm -hmm, part so. of why I was willing to, or like thought about doing it is because I need to be reminding myself of all of that stuff right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and cause we all got a shit ton of free time being stuck at home. So, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, the reason I asked you about how long it is, so when I worked at hospice, they, um, a lot, it happens a lot. So people who, um, are like the caregivers for the person that died, they almost immediately want to volunteer for hospice. Like they want to be one of the, you know, people that help. And we had a boundary that you can do that after 12 months. If you please, you know, you're more than welcome, but we have a limit of 12 months. And that limit is to give that space where they can actually heal so they won't be vicariously carrying their pain on. And so that's one of the things that first came up to me. So I, so, so that's a, you're in a great period of time. Remember, um, you know, in, in 12 step programs, we have sponsors. And so, you know, you can be thinking of it like that. Um, I really, um, I really love one of this. It, it just is kind of like a reset is, is um, in the 12 step program. They say, all I can share is my experience, strength, and hope. And if you can keep it to those three, so to keep it to those three and also PS, you have to be the real deal. Like you're healthy. You have a whole new level of accountability. Like, you know, like if, if you're going to teach them, you want it to be real. And so, um, and then that's a great thing that helps us not do our fucked up things to ourselves. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, somebody uh -huh. else's, um, you know, I don't, that's not who I want to be or whatever. And the other thing, and, and I have to do it all the time myself, is I also have to remember my fun. Make sure that I'm not working harder than the person on helping them. Uh -huh. And, um, and, and just make sure, you know, just a, a lot of times when, when some, it's, I don't wait anymore till it goes bad. I just like have a wonder about it. And I think, oh, maybe that was a little bit of more fawning than, and it, cause we'll fawn unconsciously. Like we'll, we'll, you know, fall into a baby deer, uh, you know, blink of an eye. But um, yeah. So how, how does that sound? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, my therapist had asked me like, how able I am to not take on their issues. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm, a little bit maybe. Like, mm -hmm. um, and I think some of that is that I'm used to being able to be a caregiver every day at work and I yeah. am not at work. So now I have to like mm -hmm. amass like other people. Muscle. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm, definitely aware that I need to be aware of that, but mm -hmm. I don't know how aware that I, of a, I'm not sure how aware I am of doing it at the time. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it sounds like you're on the precipice, like you're ready, you know, you're, you're on in that place. And I think that just takes a little bit of, you know, just a check in is like, like, I mean, cause you're, what you're saying is like, you, you know, you're a leader now, you know, you're, you're somebody who stands for recovery and, and it, it sounds like to me, I mean, that sounds like you automatically, you know, and I, I think, you know, but, but I think you might feel a little bit more comfortable just doing a little bit more work and also like what you want it to look like, what you don't want it to look like, and what are the tools that you're going to use to make sure and all that. So. Yeah, I think it, my fear is partially too that I just feel like a hypocrite because I'm like not always doing the mm -hmm. things I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and which is part of why I know that I need to be going back through all of the material and like yeah. 
but it also, and I told them like, I'm going to tell you all these things. And this is not to say that I know how to do them in real life, but this is, you know, the book and what we're going through. So. Yes, exactly. And also, you know, you're, you're telling, I have to tell you when I decided to get on social media, I was like, I guess I'm just going to spill it all. And there's something very freeing about I'm really fucked up. Like sometimes they even say in an answer, like, don't listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's an incredible freedom in it that, you know, and, and, and my commitment to my clients, um, which isn't something that I actually tell them, but my personal commitment to my clients, if I fall off or if I relapse, they will know not they will know, but, but it's not that I fell. It's that if I fall, I will get back up. That's my commitment that if I'm not doing it right, that I will get, you know, again, not right. But if I'm not doing, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing to take care of myself, that my commitment is again, not to fall off, not to not be perfect, but to be the sincere seeker that will get myself back. Um, that, that, that has served me well. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm excited for you. Okay, next we have Olivia. And her question is, how does someone start reparenting themselves? Like, when do they know when a situation is one that needs reparenting? So, Olivia, I think, yep, you're all right. Hey, Olivia. Good. So I am now working with a new counselor uh, Mm -hmm. who is taking a different approach than my previous one and is talking about that I have to start basically from the original trauma because everything else has just widened the first one. Yeah. Um, And we started talking about reparenting, but I don't really understand when I'm supposed to know to like do something and when something does happen that I should be actively reparenting, how to do that? Such a great question. And um, the the first answer that I was going to give is like, when you find all that out, will you let me know how to do it? Like, it's just, I mean, it's just so big. And this reminds me of the same the same, um, this is in the same lane as how do we do self care? How do we know ourselves? How do we, you know, like one of the things of the fun is that we can't make a decision because we were never, we never learned what we like. And so there's no self here. There, there is nothing here. Um, and, and, and so, so when somebody says, um, (laughs) I did my, uh, a TikTok recently about like, you know, when my therapist would say, okay, it's time to, you know, love yourself. It, it wasn't like, I don't want to, or it's like, this is lame or anything. It was like, I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> so I don't, I don't understand. And um, at the time I felt like a real dumb dumb. But what I realized is like, of course I didn't understand it's as if it's a true, truly a foreign language and nobody beats themselves up because they don't speak German. Nobody, you know, they, nobody beats themselves up because they don't speak um, French. Like we don't say, Oh, I'm such a piece of shit. Cause I don't speak French. It's like, no, we don't know how to do it. Like we, 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 so we've never talked to ourselves, but with self-love, self-care, reparenting um, it's so foreign. So that's the good news. That, that's the, the bad news. The good news is, is that you get to make it up as you go along. They, and it sounds like this counselor will teach you how to do it. Um, so uh, one of my, like, this is one of the first things I did um, years and years and eons ago was like, what do I like? Do I like anything? And I just started making a list. A couple of things I like are right here. Fine point Sharpies. I love fine point Sharpies. So that was what I was writing with at the time. And I just wrote fine point Sharpies. Do I want another kind? No. And they have held up to be my favorite thing to write with. What else do I love? I love the color pink. I love the color blue. I 
Um, you know, I like coffee, which coffee place, which, you know, like just starting to get to know myself. Another way through for me is um, there's a way to, so this is a, a, this is a tool that people have used is, and I've used it in the past myself. It's like, I, I would ask myself a question. So how are you feeling today? How are you feeling today? And then switch the pen to the non-dominant hand and answer. And then whatever, you know, whatever it comes out, just trust, just trust the process. I mean, this is no, but, but you may get hints about what that part of you, the part of you that needs to be parented, that sweet little girl, little angel, um, what she's up to and what she is interested in and what she likes. So can you, if you, then you don't have to, this is, um, this is, you know, very vulnerable, but do you, can, do you have any idea of something that that part of you liked, like a show, a color, a cartoon character? It's funny when you brought up the fine tip Sharpie, I just, at one point while I was still living at home, I remember talking to someone and saying like, my favorite kind of soap is the Dove, like coconut milk. It's a pink bar of soap and I love it. I feel so much better when I use it. And I have not thought about it in years, but that's what popped into my mind. That's amazing. I have chills. I have chills. So um, next time you're risking your life to go get food like we all are now, I do want you. Will they have it at like a regular grocery store? Or, oh, yeah, I guess you could get it from Amazon. Typically they do. At least. Okay, okay. Guess what you're going to have in your bathroom soon. <laughs> So, and so this is the way that I love to do this work for me because, you know, I, it brings me joy and these things may seem silly, but they're actually really important. And, and for me, it, it's part of, it's kind of, it has the seeds in what I like to uh, live or how I like to think about my life is like, I live a symbolic life, like symbols are really important to me. And there's some symbols you may or may not have seen, like a occasional Goody Tama or something, you know, the, for, that I have shown. But like that kind of stuff, like it, 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 it's amazing what it can do. Like it's amazing. And so, um, and what's so cool is you're going to follow that thread. So follow that thread and then you'll see what else is next. You'll see what else you really miss or you really love. And, you, and we get to have it. And this isn't just about taking care of ourselves or anything like that, but it's truly getting to know ourselves and to live, you know, that's what I think of when I say, think of like live from my most authentic place, place is like, I have permission to like the shit I like. I have full permission to like whatever the fuck I get to like, like it's, I, I get to do that. And for me, that was a way in of like, what do I like? And then it, for me to start that reparenting process. Th different therapists do it different ways. And so you'll just keep finding the one that resonates with you. But I'm excited about your soap. <laughs> well, thank Is you. that helpful? You're welcome. Completely. Awesome. Good, good, good. Great job. Y'all are so amazing. I love you all. Awesome. Hey, we got a couple more things to go through. Um, okay. But you guys are doing awesome. I love it. And you guys are being so awesome in the chat. That's what we love about this is just how supportive and what a great atmosphere this is. Okay. So the next question was actually one that I got from the, um, uh, the list. And it says, what are some tips with getting out of a funk? Like, for example, one day they just felt so cloudy, just so blah. Um, they were easily annoyed with family members. And just going through a lot right now, um, too close to family members, the state of the world, having deaths in the family, and just haven't been feeling like themselves. Like, how, what are your tips on how to get out of that? Okay, this is about to be really annoying. Like, really, this is the worst, it's the worst news. Um, I have a list. I have a fucking list. 
that when I'm in a funk, I I let myself be in a funk. I, I will let myself be in a, in a funk for a little while, but I can't let that go on too long. And so that's when I, that's when I say to myself, like, oh, I got to do my list. Um, the list includes shit I don't want to do, but that I know I will feel better after I do them. So that's the nightmare list. Um, one of the first things is, is to clean a room. So clean, go do the dishes, go, you know, get the, get at least one room clean. Um, walking for 30 minutes is right there after that. Do I want to go on a walk? Absolutely not. Do I go on a walk? Probably not. But should I go? On a walk? <laughs> no, um, I will. I will make myself do it. I don't want to leave the house. I hate everything and everyone, but I will go on that walk. And I treat that list like a prescription. Um, and, but the, I want to remind you that th this this is different times. Like the people that live in our house can drive us fucking crazy. Like can make us lose it. And, and I know that. So, so my husband and I were both super, super introverts and like he works upstairs for the whole, like he's working upstairs and I, and I'm down here, but sometimes like, I, like, cause he'll do a conference call or something like that. And I'm like, how loud do you have to talk? Like, how? <laughs> and I love this man, <laughs> but it's just like the irritability, like, so it's right. All our irritability is right in the surface. And, and some of our anxiety and angst is a uh, natural consequences for a fucking pandemic. Like it, it, of course, you know, we can't expect ourselves not to be in a funk. So it might be sometimes it's like, I, I, I went through this thing, um, where I was in a funk, like it was a funk, but luckily it was also time for the Olympics. <laughs> I just like parked myself at the TV for two weeks. <laughs> Cause what I was going through, I'm just like, I, and, and, and I was proud of myself. Like it's the Olympics. And I'm going to give myself permission to watch all these Olympics. I mean, Olympics last a really long time and it takes over the whole day. Um, so, so if, if that were me right now falling into a funk, I would let myself fall into a pandemic funk or fall into, you know, just like, I, and so, and what I mean when I say fall into, I don't mean depressive thoughts necessarily. I would, for me, it just shows up as like, no motivation to do anything. And so knowing like this makes sense. Um, I, I saw an article the other day and it, you know, what it just said, like, you don't have to be productive in the pandemic. And it was like, yes, I'm so glad. Like all these people are going to have all this shit done, but I'm not. And I'm glad, you know, it's fine. Like I don't need to do that um, because I know that my psyche is working on this. So, so, so let me say the tool again, you make a list all the things that you don't want to do, but you will, you know, from your life experience that it does make you feel better. And then you have to start doing the things on the list. And it's, it's, it's uh, pretty annoying. There's a, there's a 12 step pro quote that goes, um, we can't think ourselves into right behavior but we can be behave, behave ourselves. This is not, I'm but butchering it, but we can take actions that will actually change our thinking. So we can't think our way. I don't want to be depressed anymore. That does not work, but we can act in a way that will hopefully re relieve the funk. And if I do like four things on my list and I'm still in a, if I do four things, I'm really proud of myself. Um, but if I'm still in the funk, then I would say, as I'm assessing myself, it's like, well, I guess I need to be in a phone, you know, and, and I will send an alarm on my phone that in an hour, we're going to do something else on that list. And then the cycle continues until one day I forget that I'm in a phone. That's really good feedback. I find myself that way too, all the time, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you, and you can't have over. I'm guilty of this, of having too high of expectations for myself. Like I'll create yes. that list and be like, oh, I should have done those four and I didn't do it. You know, so really understanding that it's okay to let your diet, you have time. Do your, yes. what is, I'm going to butcher the name, the 
good good tama yes right good tama you're saying it correctly yes exactly she's teaching me stuff she's teaching me um so let me just clarify something it's not a to-do list it's not a to-do list it is a list of behaviors that you have had experience in your life where you you have felt better afterwards the one i can think of is um you know exercise we i don't know i don't like to exercise but um so some of you may but but I know if I do that, I will feel awesome afterwards. I'll, I'll, I'll feel so proud of myself that I did it. And I also know that how the body works and that I will get endorphins from that. And so, yeah. So yeah, we don't, we can't trick our funk into doing our to-do list. <laughs> we might want to do that, but it's like, please. So this isn't stuff that's just necessarily hard. It's stuff that you know that will make you feel better. And we all have an idea. Like order makes me feel better. Um, you know, exercise makes me feel better. So. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and then we had another question and this gal actually had to leave early from lunch uh, for her lunch break. But she was wondering, she is an undergrad right now looking to mm -hmm. go into psychology, therapy, counseling. And she's wondering, do you have any tips for master programs with psychology? Kind of a general question. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, she's not here. So whatever you have for that. Absolutely. And this can um, apply to any of us in our career path. But it, it, it so, so actual programs, I don't know. The one that I, if I had... If I could have, um, well, it's not that I couldn't have chosen, but my, like, I love expressive arts. That's why my counseling pra practice is called expressive uh, therapy, expressive counseling. I don't even know my business name anymore. Um, it's been so long in the pandemic uh, that I would have gone to some kind of like expressive arts thing or maybe even art therapy or some or super 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 Jungian like give me let me go to California and get all my depth psychology training or whatever but I had two kids in middle school and um that's when I decided to go get my master's in counseling and so what I did was um and it was fine because you come to find out you can sometimes you just need the degree to get to do the thing that you love and so, um, or do the thing that you want to do. So I, um, the, the school was adequate. Like it was great. Like it was a, a good experience and I, I learned a lot, learned a lot there. Um, but, but what I did was say, I had lots of choices, which do, do I want to be a social worker? Do I want to be a psychologist? Do I want to be a counselor? Do I want to be a psychiatric nurse? What, you know, what do I, which one do I do? I just set out all, I took the, the, the core, class curriculums of each program and I just looked at them all and I made the decision what do I want to spend my time doing in these two years what what do I want to do and it was not psychologist it was not social worker it was counseling that just everything on the syllabus like seemed like so much fun and I know I'm strange but um like that's what I wanted to do and that's how I made my choice in fact when I was interviewed because I was already an RN and so when I was interviewed um for the program the the guy basically said what are you doing here <laughs> it was like you're not gonna make the money you can make if you're a nurse like you should stay I'm like I need to do this program um I didn't say it like that. Like, oh yeah, absolutely. But this, and you know, I, you know, I sold it. You know, a bitch sold it to why she needed that counseling degree. Um, and so that's what I would do. I would, um, you know, just consider different programs. If you can go anywhere, like, what do you want to do? Like, what interests you? And go to that program. I mean, there's all. I mean, there's so many ways to do this work. So, um, just again, follow the thread. Okay, perfect. I'll make sure to know, let her know that you answered that question. Um, and we do have one more, uh, a couple more actually. Chrissy, do you have something you wanted to ask? Yeah, okay. Um, hi. Hi, Chrissy. Hi, sweetie. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm not sure if I even know how to phrase this right, so I'm just going to say out what's in my head. But Awesome. Um, 
so Abby had mentioned feeling like hypocritical and then I remembered I actually had a question. <laughs> I use dark humor a lot to cope. Uh, probably not the best thing I do, but um, it is what it is. I don't know how to set boundaries like at all with people. I'm just not good at it. And I have a friend, I have t two friends that um, almost make dark humor about my issues. And like, I would think that it's common sense not to do that to somebody else. But like, then I feel hypocritical because I do the same thing. So like, I think they're just trying to relate to me. But like, it just makes me feel like garbage. And I don't know how to like, tell them without seeming like an asshole. <laughs> my hunches is that they're being shitty to you. And using the guys. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, because people can, um, I am a dark humor bitch. Like that is my life's, I mean, that's what, that's what I'm running on is just dark humor, the darkest, the darkest possible. Um, and, but you know, a lot of cruelty precedes the words. I was just joking, like a lot of cruelty and abuse is. And, and so, um, if they're, you know, so it's like we're together and ha ha ha, we're laughing or some dark humor thing. And then somebody says, um, well, I don't know what goes in your office because you are crazy or it's some stupid shit like that. That's a terrible example. But because um, my, my, my people are really good at cutting humor. Um, I don't know. Do y'all know that the, uh, the, root word for sarcasm is uh, flesh cutting. So I'm, I'm a long line of uh, sarcastic people. Um, so, but there's a difference. And, and so I'm conscious. So if I'm conscious and I'm in adult mode, again, uh, I would use the ladder of trust. It's like, oh, I thought we were here, but now you're making fun of me again. It's like, ugh. so I, I figure out where I am with that. And then the other one is, um, if it feels like a dig, it was a dig. And it doesn't get to be, they're trying to drip, put it in a dress, a dig in a dress. Um, yeah. they're, they're trying to put the, di the dig in drag, um, but it's not gonna, it, we're not doing that. Like it, we don't, they don't get to do that. We're done. Yeah, it's like, I feel like I kind of like let them get away with a lot more because I do the same thing. But then again, they're also, my issues so it's like um like the best example I can think of is like something happened a couple months ago and we were in her car and I make I make I use a lot of dark humor memes off the internet and she said that she had this one that made her think of me and I was like mm, something is telling me not to ask what it is but she told mm -hmm. me anyway and she was like, it was something along the lines of like, oh, am I finally getting better? Or is this just another manic episode? And now I ask myself that every time I'm in a good mood. And like, I told her that and she still makes jokes and things about it. So I'm like, maybe don't do that. Yeah. But then I feel yeah. like I'm being hypocritical. <laughs> I don't hear that as being hypocritical. Because again, like, and we all, this is common sense. The thing about, um, like, I can talk shit about my, um, kids or husband or whatever friend, but you can't <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like I can, I can do that, but, but, the, and, and we all know that, like, we all know that those are, you know, we have to protect it. And, and so if I am talking shit about one of them, um, one of the dum-dums, um, it's not because I'm trying to be mean or throw them under the bus, but it's because I'm trying to process it. You know, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And, um, so I, I get to do that, but no, if, and I can't even, I can't even think of a person who would say, well, remember, well, excuse me. I just remembered someone. Um, uh, <laughs> um, still having fears about all this going out on the, uh, in the world and, and my family members that don't know that I do this finding it, but whatever. Um, they know not to say that about my kids or about me, you know? And, and so there's a level of kindness. And, and I also want to say that it, to me, it's, the word isn't hypocritical and we don't know something until we know it. Like, it's just like, oh, I don't like it when they do that. Again, we don't know what we like. And so you finally found something that you, you don't like that we can, um, 
I want to, when I'm, this is like huge. I'm not going to give people that I know who are mean to me weapons to use. And that codependents do do that. We tell unsafe people sacred information, us, you know, protective information, and they will turn it around and use it as a weapon. So uh, the way, you know, the way I cured that was I stopped giving them the weapons. You know, there's a lot of people in my family that don't even know, you know, what I do or because I'm not going to. I'm not going to give the weapons and we can learn by the ladder of trust, like, Oh, this is not a safe person. And so, but yeah, so that's one, one of the things I had to get conscious about that. You know, the thing that they were shaming with me with was the thing that I told them and why. So now I, I want to feel that consequence. So I don't tell them that stuff anymore. They don't, they lost privileges. No, no, no. Yeah, I think um, even though we were just talking about trying not to need validation, I kind of needed validation to like feel okay to tell them that I'm just like not having it anymore. Like <laughs> they just seem like kind of like a jackass to me now. And like I felt bad for feeling that way, but now I don't. <laughs> Good. Well, and I would say it's like, hey, you know that I, I don't like joking about that anymore. I realize like it, it really hurt to make my self esteem take a hit. So I, I don't, or so, you don't have to say that, but. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't like that. To me, that's not funny anymore. And just move on from there. And they might still be laughing in your face as you say it. But again, now we know more about that person. Yeah, it's time to cut them off. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you. Love you. Bye. Okay. Um, I'm just going to cut in real quick. We have one more question if we can get to that since we had some technical difficulties getting started. So we're going to go over just a few few moments. Um, this one comes from Sarah. We're going to fit this in. Um, she said she's having a question of how to come over imposter syndrome. Uh, and Sarah, I'm just going to let you go ahead and ask the question straight so I don't mix this up. <laughs> Hi, hey, Sarah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have just been really struggling with imposter syndrome a lot lately. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly it result, revolves around um, the fact that I um, feel just feeling um, not capable, I guess, or confident a lot mm -hmm. of the time, um, especially I started this new venture about uh, eight months ago. I launched a website that is a grief resource website. Oh, cool. To help people find grief resources in my area. Um, and I started that because my brother died from a suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually launched it a year to the date of his death. Mm -hmm. not really knowing what I was doing. I mean, I'm not a web designer. I don't really have um, the technical skills. So um, I, you know, just struggling, feeling like, um, like, I guess, worthy of doing this work. Yeah. And just um, feeling like, uh, I don't know that I have a lot to say that's super unique, um, or um, I don't know, I think other, there's a lot of other people in the grief world doing it really well and putting out great content, and um, that doesn't feel like my strength. Um, I'm really good at the researching and the, finding the resources and helping connect people to resources, but um, it's kind of boring, I guess, and, and I don't know how to... Um, um, I don't know, get past that feeling like I just am not sure what I'm doing and I don't know how to um, really get this out there to people that need it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry about your brother. It's heartbreaking. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed, um, but we were all wrapped with attention. Like we, you had us, like the moment you started speaking, we all were intently listening. And so that means that your, your voice is actually needed to talk about these things and to, to give, uh, your experience. I, um, I've, I've had a few losses in my life and I'm a grief counselor too. Um, 
but I've never gone through what you've gone through. And I've never watched a family go through what you saw your family go through. That's what so many people would love to hear. Like, let me know that somebody lived through this. Let me know like what, what, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, I, and I can. This, and I, it's a real unique ex, um, sort of twist. The, the twist on this, it's not, it wasn't just a regular, like a regular suicide, if there is such a thing. Um, and this is hard for me to know too, like when it's okay to talk about this or bring this up with people or share this part of the story. Um, but um, so my brother had bipolar too, and mm -hmm. he was very um, high functioning just an awesome person too and a, a wonderful guy and, and um, just had this horrible moment on this particular day mm -hmm. happened to be on July 4th too which was great mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of ruined that holiday mm -hmm. um, but he and his girlfriend got into a big fight and he just wasn't thinking and acted really impulsively and he grabbed a gun that was accessible easily to him and he actually he shot her and so she died and then he shot oh himself goodness. afterwards. So it's weird to, for me to, to be like in this public sort of space, like trying mm -hmm. to help people with, with grief and suicide loss, but then um, because there's just such a yeah. stigma and a twist on the story. And yeah. so <laughs> sometimes I struggle with like, how do I, how do I tell this and have it land? I get that. The way yeah. I, want it to, I guess, or the right yes. way, if there is such a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's nobody else out there telling this story for, no. from this point of view of being no. a, a family member of a perpetrator who right. you know, committed a crime but then killed themselves. So I'm sad, of course, for what he did. And I think it was a horrible thing that happened. And I'm sad for her and her family. But I feel my grief is for my brother, really. Right, right. Um, I was going to start talking about this today on um, TikTok and Instagram about uh, disenfranchised grief. So disenfranchised grief yeah. is when our grief isn't acknowledged by society. Right. And, and sometimes, so, so I would say suicide is already a disenfranchised grief because people might, you know, they can, they can minimize it because it was a choice. You know, they could, but, but it doesn't make that grief less valid. Um, and, and then this, but yours is disenfranchised. Well, probably more than this, but twice. Right. Disenfranchised because of that, just the, the nature of his death and that he committed a crime. And, and I don't even know how that works, but, but yeah. And, and so again, it, and, and I prompt you will figure that out you will figure that out. And that, that leads you to the, <clears throat> the imposter syndrome thing is it's like, you're the last person that needs to have that because you ha have frontline actual experience and mm -hmm. you are not the only one who this has happened to. There's so many other right. people. And I have to say, I, I disenfranchised it because I never, even though I'm in the field, I never thought about what the family of the person who does the homicide suicide thing. I never thought about that. And that's telling because I think about this stuff a lot. So that's actually, um, yeah, your, your voice is needed and you will figure that out. And, and sometimes it'll be like, you'll test something, not, you'll just put something out there and like, Oh, they didn't like that, you know, or, or you'll get a troll or something like that. And you have to decide how much of that you can tolerate or whatever. Um, but let me just say one thing about the imposter syndrome in general is that um, it's fawn related because if we don't have a self, if we don't, our lot if we don't know what we like, we don't know what we want. And then we start doing something and we're fucking good at it. Um, we then don't give ourselves credit for it because it's again, a betrayal to the family, a betrayal to, you know, the toxic family of origin or whatever. And so, um, so that makes sense to me about imposter syndrome. So for me, it makes, it's like, Oh, good. Imposter syndrome is also just healing from codependency and being a fawn. Um, but you, you get your voice, you get to have your voice and you get to, 
you know, it's, it seems like you're guided to do this and then it feels really important to you. And then it's that question. It's like, if not you, who I've never seen anything like this before anywhere ever. Like, if not you, who, and, and, um, you, you that, get that your was exactly voice. I thought when I started the website, like I literally, I had the idea in a counseling session actually. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks later was the day I actually made it. I spent a whole day in a cafe on the 4th of July. Um, just like starting from scratch on we yeah. free website. And it was, it was just like, I, I just felt like it's better to have something up than nothing because right now yeah. there is nowhere, at least where I live, where I could go to find like, what are the local support groups and the good counselors around here? And like, what's crisis, what crisis help can I go to? And what are the good articles or books to read? Like, I didn't mm -hmm. know where to start with that. Um, so I just, I was like, this is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> there needs to be something like this in every yeah. city or every area, you know, yeah. For, can go and find that stuff because when you're in that fog of grief you can't really think very clearly it really took me a whole year to get to that spot yeah. <laughs> that I you know and collect all those resources and stuff and just decide I need to put this in one place because nobody else is yeah doing this um, do you like um a lack, a lack yeah absolutely there is I, again it, it, there is I I mean I'm so interested and enthralled because it's just I've just never thought about it before and yeah how how did that did that make sense about the imposter syndrome and fawning yeah, yeah. okay yeah I think so um yeah fawning is kind of a new thing for me to like me, I mean me I, I've read, been reading about polyvagal theory and watch like listening to podcasts and reading books and stuff about it but like most people don't really talk about the fawn aspect no I've never heard it before I read Pete Walker's stuff and so yeah I, it's it's incredible I, but it's it, yeah. imposter syndrome is is probably probably that person is from a yeah. um ha has childhood trauma in yeah. some way shape or form yeah I know definitely yeah. that when you said that fawning is extreme people pleasing in order to survive, I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> sure. like, let me I just mean, check that box. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm a pastor's kid. So like I grew up having to be like, you know, perfect. And, perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And my brother, my brother was kind of the, the black sheep sort of like, he was the one that got to rebel and mm -hmm. you know, stuff, but I was, had to be the good girl kind of thing. Oh, so of I course. think a lot of yeah. that comes from that for sure. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, I would keep follow the thread and keep taking yeah. the next right step and really listen to your guidance and stay safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Alrighty. I want to say thank you for sharing that, Sarah, and look in the comments. There were lots of good comments about, you know, supporting you as well as those of us who have had family members that did commit suicide. And from my perspective, what you're talking about is would be phenomenal because there aren't very many resources for people how to grieve a suicide um it's a tough situation it's, yours was even a tougher level above that but look in those comments and if you could could you share your website with us so that yeah, we could of course see it? sure um, perfect I'll type it in here yeah thank you is, um thank you. That, the, the local resources are specific to the boise area just so you know but there's lots of stuff on there that's general for grief so Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so with that, Elizabeth, uh, that's everybody that we have for today. Uh, would you like to close it up? I would. I forgot to give everybody fairy dust, so I'll do that real quick. Oh. I'm going to do it with this wand. My Sharpie. You get fairy dust. I get fairy dust. Amelie gets fairy dust. It's so funny. Every time she, every time I stop talking, she comes over. So she's about to pay me a visit. Guys, thank you so much. I'm so honored. It's been yeah, it's just such an honor for me. I'm so grateful. Um, thank you for being in this with me. And I'm just, again, it's so inspiring to have everybody just to know how many people are out there doing this hard work. So good job, everybody. And thank you. And I'll say bye. Love you.